Welcome to another session of History Bites. We started talking last time about political, religious, economic, social evolution of the colonies. And we, uh, when we quit, we were talking about social evolution. Uh, when we talked about uh, the development of towns and cities, I mentioned that there were three buildings that were crucial to a town. In fact, every settlement, every town had to have three particular buildings or they could be fined. Those three buildings were the church, a tavern, and the blockhouse. The church, of course, needs no explanation. Uh, the blockhouse was a safety house where, uh, in case of an Indian attack or an enemy attack, uh, the people of the town would go into the blockhouse, which the bottom of the building was smaller than the top. They would go up into the top, pull the ladder up after them, close the trap door, and it would give them a measure of safety. The tavern was the other building. A town could be fined if they did not have a tavern. Taverns played an important part of the social fabric of colonial lives. Taverns, in fact, were part of uh, the social, political, and travel lives of the colonies. Colonial assemblies regulated the taverns. In fact, by regulating the taverns, this was a means where the colonial assembly could regulate the use of alcoholic beverages. Um, taverns provided many needs. Uh, not only lodging, food, and drink, but also entertainment. Entertainment might mean games, conversations, debates, discussions, a lot. In fact, when you get close to revolutionary period of the colonies, uh, taverns played a very crucial role in leading to and spreading uh, the ideas of revolution. It was also, the tavern was also where uh, the people received their news and got their mail. There were very, in the early colonial days, there were no post offices. Uh, mail would come in to a central location, uh, perhaps where the colonial assembly met, and then uh, the mail would be divided and distributed to different towns and settlements. If it was news coming in from uh, overseas, from England or other parts of Europe, the mail would be loaded off of the ships, taken to a nearby tavern, and from there, there would be post riders that would take the mail to different towns, different areas of the colonies. So people in a settlement, in a town, would go to the local tavern and now don't think of it as there being private boxes where mail was put in slots but in fact usually it was laid out on a table and you sorted through it until you found something uh, with address to you. Newspapers, very few people had subscriptions to newspapers but these taverns would have a prescription um, not only to local newspapers but also to foreign newspapers because people in the colonies were as interested in what was going on in England as they were what was going in, on in their local area. So you get your mail, you get your news. Also it's where you receive information on travel. You know if you stop at the local tavern you can find uh, the best way to get to uh, wherever you're going. If you're going to a particular, let's say, a farm, a certain family, it's the tavern that can give you the information of how to find them. Also, they give you information about the roads, condition of the roads. So taverns played a very essential role in the lives of the colonists. The buildings for the taverns uh, were simply designed and coordinated 
They were usually independent structures, although occasionally they would be connected to a residence or perhaps another building. There would be several rooms in a tavern. Uh, the largest room would be, called, would be what was called the tap room. That is where drinks uh, and meals would be served. There would be tables, chairs. And now, don't think of these taverns as being like uh, bars of today where you have the long polished bar with stools uh, set up to the bar. But in fact, and I'll show you some images uh, on the next slide or two of some of these colonial taverns, but there would be a cabinet or a little corner set up where they would have the bottles or the kegs of the drinks and uh, glasses or mugs where they would serve the drinks from that area. So it would be the tap room, uh, parlors, so that if you're traveling with the family, uh, you might reserve a parlor where you could have your meals served in the parlor and have a little bit of privacy. Women and children were not normally seen in the tap room uh, unless they had to go through the tap room to get to the parlor. So the family is traveling, um, they would be uh, in the parlors. So the Depending on the size of the tavern, the size of the town, uh, there might be one or two parlors. Also, they would have meeting rooms. Uh, a lot of times these taverns would be two stories, and they would have several meeting rooms where uh, people could, groups could meet. Also, meeting rooms were used to hold dances when the people would, from the community would come together uh, for entertainment with music and dancing. So several meeting rooms and then of course sleeping rooms. And again, don't think of sleeping rooms as being private. They might have two sleeping rooms, one for men and one for women. Uh, they might have several beds in the men's sleeping room, uh, but you might have two or three men sleeping in a bed strangers. Uh, same way in the uh, sleeping room for women and children, uh, you might be sharing a bed with strangers. So you didn't expect privacy and privacy was not available. So there were laws pertaining to taverns and these laws of course were set by the colonial assemblies. A license was required just about anybody could open a tavern, but it did require a license and you had to apply to the Colonial Assembly and pay a fee to get a license. It was the Colonial Assemblies that set the prices for services, for drinks, for meals, for rooms, uh, for sleeping, to stable your horses, if they offered that service. Not every tavern would, but uh, usually uh, there might be an area or a stable close by, a livery stable, where you might put your horses. Um, if there was no tavern in the town, let's say, for instance, the town had a tavern, but um, perhaps the tavern owner uh, died or moved away, the Colonial Assembly would offer inducements for somebody else to open a tavern. Those inducements might include a land grant, not only uh, land to build your tavern, but also perhaps extra land for grazing your a few head of, head of cattle or horses. Um, sometimes the inducement would be exemptions from school or church taxes. So inducements, because every community, every town needed to have this tavern. A typical day at a tavern, they would normally serve breakfast about nine o'clock. Uh, a lot of times you might have artisans, uh, perhaps local farmers, businessmen who would uh, come to the tavern at nine o'clock in the morning to have breakfast, to catch up on the latest news, perhaps to do a little bit of business, maybe 
captains of ships might meet with potential uh, passengers or a businessman who wants to ship something uh, on board his ship. So nine o'clock breakfast. After breakfast, the tavern music would be open for men who wanted to play games. Uh, that was a very popular thing, playing card games, board games, uh, dart games, maybe just to sit around, smoke, have a drink, and conversation with your neighbors. Uh, dinner usually, which was for colonials, the largest day of the meal. A uh, tavern would serve dinner about two o'clock in the afternoon. And then after that dinner, uh, again, the tavern would be open for uh, personal entertainment, people to come in to see if they had any mail or to see if there's a new edition of the newspaper, maybe to have conversation with other customers about what's in the news. Then in the evening, uh, supper, a light, usually a very light meal, would be served about 7 o'clock. And then after that, you would have evening entertainment, which might include um, singing and maybe uh, somebody traveling through that played an instrument and sang. But a lot of times, people in the community would come together and just sing together. If the tavern offered a piano or some kind of instrument, someone might play and everybody join in uh, singing songs together. Or they might have a reading. Not everyone could afford books, but everyone was very interested in colonial days of gaining information. So a lot of times, someone with a book, they would bring it to the tavern after supper. They might all sit around and take turns reading from the book. Or if there was one individual who everybody enjoyed their voice, uh, that person might read from the book. Customers were predominantly male. Merchants and mariners would often meet at a local tavern uh, to talk about uh, potential voyages. Uh, members of the assemblies would often meet together at the local tavern to talk about issues that they were dealing with, colonial business. Travelers, farmers, artisans, also, taverns served as official and unofficial gathering places for groups, uh, such as social clubs, which we're going to talk about next. Groups like the Freemasons, uh, the Sons of Liberty, lawyers. In fact, uh, one thing that comes to mind is uh, Patrick Henry in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, a young man who had tried his hand at uh, tobacco farming until he had a couple of years of bad harvest and then his uh, house burnt down. And he ended up working for his father-in-law in his father-in-law's tavern. And as he worked in the tavern, he would hear these lawyers coming in. The lawyers would be sitting around in the tavern uh, talking about their cases and their uh, plans for defense or prosecution and Patrick Henry would listen to them and he made a statement to his father-in-law that or to himself that he could do that so having listened to them in the tavern he decided he would become a lawyer and he studied according to whichever account you read either six weeks or six months he had earned his uh, law degree and had become a lawyer. Um, so taverns were a big part of life, very important uh, in a lot of ways. Tavern signs were regulated by the Colonial Assembly. They were to be inoffensive and uh, provide, and this is a quote, directions for travelers. But in all the research I did in the taverns um, that I saw, and even taverns uh, when we made a trip to Boston last summer, 
I could not tell that any of the signs actually gave uh, advice to travelers, so I'm not, ex not sure exactly uh, how that worked. But taverns played a crucial role in the revolutionary uh, era. Many of the meetings by the Sons of Liberty, uh, by colonials who were dissatisfied with British policies, met in the taverns, they made plans, uh, they talked about their principles. Um, so taverns played a very large role in the Revolutionary Era. Uh, you see the images at the bottom of the slide. There's one on the far left that gives uh, rules for a particular tavern. Rather interesting. Four pence a night for a bed. Six pence with potluck. Uh, two pence for keeping your horse. And no more than four to sleep in one bed. Uh, no boots to be worn in bed. No razor grinders or tinkers were to be taken in. Uh, no dogs allowed in the kitchen. Organ grinders could sleep in the wash house. Um, now organ, or sorry, the razor grinders and the tinkers were the lowest low of society. They were uh, more or less homeless, um, vagabonds that would go from house to house or settlement to settlement trying to um, get paid for sharpening your razors or your uh, tools. Uh, tinkers would take items around, sometimes used items, items that he had confiscated perhaps from a trash heap, trying to sell to make a little money. Um, in fact, uh, two of the images at the bottom in the middle, the image next to the rules for the tavern shows a razor grinder with his grinding wheel. And then the next image over from that is the tinker. The organ grinder, the one that could sleep in the wash house, is the next image. Um, he has a monkey on top of his grinder. And he was a little higher in society than the razor grinder or the tinker, so he could sleep in the wash house. Uh, the image on the far right is an image of the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston. That played a very large role. Many of the revolutionaries writing to each other or from, from their journals, we see that they met in the Green Dragon to make plans towards a revolution. More images on the next slide. Uh, those are all of taverns, either inside or outside the taverns. If you notice, the image uh, at the top on the right shows the inside of a tavern. And if you look on the right side of that image, you can see a little uh, cabinet-like area. And the alewife, remember that's one of the occupations that women could work in public at. Uh, she is serving a drink to a gentleman that is standing there. Other men are seated at a table in front of the fireplace. Uh, the image right below that again is inside a tavern. Those men that you see gathered there, those are revolutionaries making plans, talking about ideas, perhaps arguing about British policies. And again, the alewife is in that uh, cabinet type area. Below that, uh, there is a bed. That would be the kind of bed you might have to sleep in if you stopped at a tavern as a traveler. And then on the bottom, far right, is a, a pipe tavern pipe box. Those are clay pipes, and if you see the different heights of the pipe, um, most taverns would offer these clay pipes for their customers. So if you wanted to have a 
smoke with your drink. You could use the tavern pipe. You would have to buy the tobacco from the tavern keeper. But you used the pipe while you were there, and then it would be put back in the box. So when the next customer come, comes along and wants to use that same pipe, he breaks off the tip of the stem of the pipe so that he puts a clean um, part in his mouth. So that's why one of those pipes you see in the box there is much shorter than the other two. The tallest is probably a brand new clay pipe that is put there for the use of uh, tavern customers. Tim, my son, uh, collects different kinds of pipes and he has a example of a tavern pipe. Uh, he let me use it at one point to be able to take to show to my students what those clay pipes would have looked like. Social clubs. Sociability was being viewed as the root of happiness. That's in the 1700s. 1700s is the era of the Enlightenment. Uh, started in France and was spread to all of Europe and to America and these and the sociability referred to uh, the tendency or the habit of Enlightenment thinkers to gather together to talk about new ideas about the Enlightenment. So that spread and would become um, not only a part of Enlightenment, but a, a part of uh, society in general, not just in America, but also in Europe. So there were these social clubs in nearly every major city by the 1740s. They were for enjoying, and this is a quote, wit, singing, social reading, and discussion. By wit, of course, they're talking about repartee, uh, quick comebacks, sometimes humorous, sometimes not, but uh, interchange of thoughts and ideas, um, singing, and again, uh, this is everybody joining together in familiar songs, social reading. That is where they would all uh, come together to uh, share a book. Sometimes they would read the book in the clubs and then discuss it. Or sometimes, and for instance, um, Ben Franklin's social club, which is called the Junto, he encouraged all the members of the Junto Club to read the book, read the same book, and then come together on their meetings on Friday nights to discuss the book. And then discussion. Discussion included not only discussion of books, but discussion of politics, of science, of literature, new ideas. Ben Franklin's Junto, he created in 17. 27 um, seems to be the first account of any social club in the colonies. They would meet in a tavern or someone's house every Friday night to discuss, and this is a quote from Ben Franklin's autobiography, to discuss morals, politics, or natural philosophy. And as I just said, they discussed the chosen books, and because um, Ben Franklin's club, the Junto, was made up of what we would call blue-collar workers. Only at that point in time, they were called leather napier workers. And so his Franklin Social Club was first called the Leather Apron Club. So these men that joined him in his club, and he limited the number of members to 12. He didn't want them to be any larger that, than that because he believed it would become unwieldy. So 12 men who joined together, they were from different uh, professions or uh, different artisans that would meet together, not only talk about books and ideas, politics, science, but they also talked about how to improve the community. And it is through the Leather and Apron Company, country club, or the Junto, that the ideas came forth, um, and this is in Philadelphia, where Ben Franklin's club was, 
uh, ideas for the circulating library, for uh, fire brigade, to help the community because everybody used fireplace and everybody used candles um, for light. So fire was a real um, present danger for people living in the colonies. So Franklin, in order to, and his club, to improve community, set up a fire brigade. Also, it was through the Junto that ideas for a police force was instituted. And these all, these are ideas that came through Franklin's Junto. So a lot of proposals for community improvement. Other social clubs in the colonies, one was called the Tuesday Club, there was the Winya Indigo Society Club, the Scots Club, and numerous other clubs. Some were all male, and there were some clubs that were all women. Uh, in fact, Sarah Kimball Knight's Tea Table was one of those all women clubs. And then some clubs were mixed with both men and women. These clubs were for edification, that is to, for self-improvement, and also for entertainment. They were very significant in the years leading up to the revolution. Now, a lot of these clubs met in the taverns. So it's a combination, the, the significance of the taverns, and also the significance of these social clubs that would help um, lead Americans or prepare Americans for revolution. Thank you for watching this episode, and I hope you will come back. See you next time.